Danny Driver, welcome to Spotlight. Thank um, you. Very, very excited to talk about um, Beethoven and Planets, which you're performing in for us. I kind of want to jump straight into your pre-performance routine, because I love a pre-performance routine. Um, any like secret snacks you have or any... I might disappoint you, I'm, I'm very much not a pre-performance routine person. I'm no. so much more go with the flow, so it really is, yeah, I don't, I don't have a set pattern, which is very annoying when people ask me that question. Like, yeah, yeah, kind of, what are the secrets, <laughs> what are the good things? Uh, no, Maybe that is the secret though. Well, I think as far as performance goes, if you're, if you're really attuned to what's going on in the room as you're making music, for example, attuned to what the room feels like, then yeah, you, you do respond to that. So maybe before performance, that's what I'm trying to do really, is just to get into a, um, a mode of awareness. And that includes you know, what I might feel like or not feel like doing, or eating, or not eating. So, yeah. so I think to, to have a pre-programmed routine for me may be a bit dangerous. Some people I've spoken to always have like a banana before they go on, or they have like a certain snack because they get a little bit hungry. But Yeah, I've been known to have bananas, and other yeah. snacks, chocolate. Chocolate is good, um, <laughs> chocolate. not always good, yeah. Um, I like to warm up, you know, a little bit yeah. backstage, keep the fingers moving, but, but other than that, it can, be, it can be very variable. Yeah, no, it's wicked. Um, what do you find are the biggest challenges of performing in a live environment? So going from your pre-performance routine, now going on to stage, whatever venue it is, what do you find are the biggest challenges? The biggest challenge, well, for me it's about sharing, really. So there's a, there's a, there's a danger with viewing it as a, a, of course it is a big thing, you're walking on, you're, you're on show, um, you're doing something that you've worked um, hours, um, and obviously going further back, you know, months and years to be able to do, and yet, in the moment you want to you want to share you want to, to invite you want to involve people you want to bring them bring them close to you um, and that in a way is not about getting it right it's not about um, the big deadline or the, the critical moment so in a way I think because of all the pressure that surrounds performance it's that that's that's maybe this may be the most challenging it's trying, it's just remembering that that's really why we're there yeah. that's why we're all there that, that's what it's about it's not so much about me getting it right it's about me kind of um, sharing this, uh, this marvellous world that I'm kind of privileged to be living and working in with the people who are in the room, in that particular room on that particular day. When you were starting to learn um, piano, was there a performing mm. style that you, anybody that you kind of like took inspiration from that helped you kind of go in the, the style that you are or, or anything that pushed you towards learning? Well, very many musicians and very many pianists in particular, but not only, you know, um, mm. string players, conductors, you know, orchestra performances, uh, jazz musicians, the whole kind of spectrum, and it'd be kind of silly to name necessarily one. I'm, I'm not very good with favourites. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, th I think, um, to try and answer your question, the style for me very much depends on, it depends on, on the music, it depends on the piece, it depends on the audience, it depends on the energy at, um, in the room, so you know, like a more demonstrative kind of ostentatious um, manner m may suit some things very well. The end of Rachmaninoff's Second Piano Concerto, sure. Um, other things, maybe not so much. So I think, I think um, for me, it's about aligning, um, aligning my my being and and what I'm trying to to create at that moment with with what I'm finding in the music and and what might be. Say, say what I would like to, to say about it, what I'd like to share about it. Yeah. So again, it's, it's, um, yeah, it sounds like I'm avoiding all your questions, but I'm really not. <laughs> I'm gonna, it, it's, it's so much is context dependent. You mentioned um, Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto, um, and I know you're performing that at the Royal Festival Hall for us. Yes. Um, the Palace. Can you tell me a little bit more about what audiences can expect um, from that piece? And a little bit about the venue as well. Oh, it's a lovely venue to play in. I've, uh, I've had uh, many lovely experiences there. Um, I think with, with uh, more than one orchestra, actually. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's quite big, um, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel sort of um, overbearing or overwhelming. It's a fantastic piece of music. Um, I think it's, it, it's, it's a great story, that piece, if I can put it like that. It just has a, a, a beautiful narrative flow. You, you start kind of stuck with a problem, really, um, like any drama, really, kind of the, the hero of this piece, whoever he or she is, is, is kind of mired in some complex problem and the music never quite releases you from that problem, so you're kind of stewing in this situation um, and of course what happens when you stew in a dramatic situation is like you, you start to wonder how you're going to get out and, and you know as you move into the second movement you know there's hope, there's optimism, there's kind of maybe the possibility of, of getting out and, and in the last movement really you know it happens, it's just gritty um, and determined and we kind of break through from from kind of 
sort of bloom and difficulty into kind of bright sunlight at the end. It's really a triumph, and I think because it's such a great story, anyone anyone can relate to that. We, you know, we all we all have that in our lives, um, and perhaps that's why it's such a popular piece um, and why it speaks um, so strongly to so many people. You'll also be performing with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra as well. Mm. And I know from our conversations before, you've um, but work with them quite a lot. Yeah, that's right. Actually, the first thing I ever performed with them was Beethoven's Emperor Concerto. It was at the Barbican, I think, about 10, 10 plus years ago. And, and we've, done, we've done many concerts since. Uh, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, other composers as well. And they're, they're, they're a really great orchestra. I, I always uh, look forward to my, to my performances yeah. with them. So it will be, it'll be a wonderful um, opportunity to get back together with them in Symphony Hall in, in June. You mentioned um, Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto. Um, and I know you're performing that at the Royal Festival Hall for us. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what audiences can expect um, from that piece? And a little bit about the venue as well. Oh, it's a lovely venue to play in. I've, uh, I've had uh, many lovely experiences there. Um, I think with, with uh, more than one orchestra, actually. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's quite big, um, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel sort of um, overbearing or overwhelming. So that's when you're performing with us with the planets. Um, later this month, but you're also doing um, performing for us in Beethoven. That's right. Um, piano concerto number five. Number five, yeah. Nicknamed the Emperor. The yeah, Emperor yeah. Concerto. Nicknamed the Emperor. Yeah, yeah. And um, what can we just expect from that um, performance as well? There's something very grand about it. Um, there's something sort of regal. I mean, it's called the. It's not called the Emperor because it sounds emperor-like. The Emperor was his friend and his patron, and he sort of wrote it. For, Beethoven wrote it for him. Really dedicated it to him, along with a lot of other big. Uh, works, uh, but it does have this um, very, very grand manner. On the one hand, you can just sort of imagine um, sort of grandeur, pomp, and everything else. And on the other hand, um, and this is interesting, I think it's got a great sense of vulnerability and just sort of human fragility about it. So you get um, these two very seemingly opposing yeah. forces there, um, and somehow those two things have to get have to be reconciled um, yeah. and again as you know the piece goes on I think we see that you know the, the, the different musical ideas that come you, you get those two jostling together the middle movement is this beautifully serene meditation is like a dream like a prayer um, and you know the last minute again it just uh, it's a dance it rollicks along and somehow we we kind of resolve everything your, your description of that was just fantastic it kind of leads on to my next question of why why people should engage in classical music in 2023 but you've kind of just already touched on that because there's like historical aspects and there's real meaning and kind of story behind these pieces and people won't necessarily if they're kind of outside the classical music realm won't necessarily know about that but for me already that's a massive factor of why more people should get involved because it's not just listening to uh, any random song it's got storyline behind it, it's got meaning, it's got different elements. Well, it's, it's, I, think, I think you're right. Um, it's even bigger than that. I think it's got whatever storyline really that you, you find in it. I mean, that's the great thing about wordless stories. Th these are, I think these are um, great pieces of, of, of art that, that kind of tell a story, but also that they're very open. They're very open texts, if you like. So you, you, can, you can relate to it without necessarily have experienced a kind of particular kind of lexical, like word-based narrative. Yeah. It's not something that is confined to any one person or one, one cultural group's experience. It really tells a very, very human story. And it can be, it, to some extent, w w whatever story you find in it. And that's the great thing about it. It does invite, I think, and transcend um, uh, so many barriers and so many perceived barriers, if you like. What's been one of your... Um career highlights so far? There have been so many, you know, I, I'm just so lucky to be doing what I'm doing um, and uh, sort of any project that I'm kind of deeply interested in kind of becomes, it sort of becomes the highlight of the moment for me as I'm sort of traveling through and, uh, and I kind of, I'm not very good at looking back. I'm not. I'm not a great uh, yeah. kind of retrospective. But I haven't sort of looked back and think, mm, what, what, which, <laughs> which, is, which is the one. Um, but you know, being on stage at the Albert Hall with Nordstra, um playing Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, or, or, or anything, it, it's just a fantastic experience. Um, it's a. It's a very uh, big venue that one actually. But when you walk out on stage, you see it's full of people. It's also oddly intimate. It's all oddly enveloped, um, yeah. and you you do feel the connection actually. Well, fantastic. Thank you for coming on and chatting with me about um, your performances at Beethoven and the Planets. I look forward to being there and watching you perform. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. Cheers.
Thank you for watching this episode of Spotlight. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe.